Hey friends, I'm Michael Kingswood and it's story time. A little more echoes this week because I'm recording from Las Vegas. I'm up here for a week hanging with my friends, uh, staying at a buddy's place and hanging out with another buddy who's in town for the week and also scouting out because I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before but my intention is in the very near future to get the hell out of California and replant the flag here in Vegas and Nevada uh, because California is way too expensive the taxes are too much and I prefer not to give money to governments that hate me <laughs> funny how that works right so um, scouting out where I might like to move uh, this week and also doing uh, working from out here because testing out the uh, feasibility of doing my day job here as opposed to San Diego and looks like it's going to be, you know, no, no sweat at all. And, uh, you know, just checking out neighborhoods, finding what you like, what you don't like, you know, the whole sort of thing that you do, tend to do after you move to a place that you kind of wanted to do before you did it. And that's what I'm doing now. So I'll be doing that periodically for the next few months and then uh, rolling up, I don't know, probably sometime late this year, early next year, and depending how a few things work out. Anyway, so a lot to talk about this week. Um, I'm continuing on with the great writing challenge that I'm participating in. I haven't talked about it here on, well, I have talked about it here on the podcast, but I get a little uh, mixed up because I've <laughs> fallen behind the last few weeks updating my blog and website with what I have and haven't done. And I realized, oh crap, I was two weeks late and talking about the great challenge. And I haven't updated the blog with the podcast info in a while because I've been doing other things. And, you know, anyway. Uh, so, the great challenge, short story every week for a year. Uh, 16 weeks in, I've done 16 stories, continuing to win. And working on week 17 here now. Um, the other cool thing, as you know, I've talked about it here before the Infinite Bard. The uh, short fiction promotion thing that I do with a whole bunch of other writers who are friends of mine online is continuing on. Uh, promoted it a couple weeks ago. I don't think I mentioned it in the podcast here, but didn't have a separate uh, episode for it. But this week is my week. Yeah, putting out my story. Uh, so this story that I'm putting out this week for The Infinite Bard, it's going up on my site uh, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time, is uh, called Doppelganger. It's a science fiction mystery. The conceit is a little girl who's dead because she got hit by a car. They find out she's not a little girl. She's an android. But she was born as a little, actual little girl. So what happened to her? Somebody swapped out the little girl for the android. And now these two police detectives have to figure out what the hell's going on, who did it, and why. And is she still alive or not? So you can read that on my website for free. It's going to be posted up there forever. You can also, uh, well, maybe not forever, but for a good long time. Uh, you can also go buy the ebook and uh, give me some money for the story, especially if you like it. <laughs> Uh, and enjoy it and spread word to your friends. And, of course, the cool thing about The Infinite Bard is that all of us writers who are spitting it and spread it out to our to our various audiences and everybody comes and checks it out and it's pretty cool and more more exposure for everyone. So that's the, uh, the neat thing. The other thing I'm doing up here in Vegas is, uh, I'm sure you've noticed over the last you know, few months, I've been growing this mop out. I... Uh, Last November, November of 2018, I realized, hey, dude, you've been retired from the Navy for like a year and a half. Why are you still having a buzz cut all the time? So I said, screw it. I'm growing the hair out. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Last time I grew the hair out at all was in high school, uh, back in the early 90s. And it got kind of poofy and some guys who were kind of... All right, I was a dork in high school, and a bunch of guys made fun of me and started calling me Sheep Boy because my hair curled up and it looked a little Afro-ish. <laughs> Looking back on it, I can laugh, but at the time I was like, oh, this sucks. And I ended up getting a couple confrontations over it, and eventually I stopped with that. But still, I was kind of a wimpy, dorky kind of guy for a long time. 
Um, it, was, it took a long time to get over being a wimpy, dorky, gamma kind of geek guy. and I'm now firmly a Delta kind of average dude who knows some leadership stuff and knows some other things, but I still... <laughs> Anyway, I uh, still sometimes re try to revert back to that, and I hate it, and I stop. But anyway, I was doing a buzz cut forever, and I didn't own a hairbrush for 25 years. So last November, I started growing it out. It's like, fuck it, let's see what how it works. And uh, I've, you've seen, if you're watching this video podcast for the last year, it's been going in and out and in and out because I've been learning about hair because I've never had to deal with hair before. Learning about it is like, going to various places. I got hairspray to try to keep it under control. That didn't work so well. And I found this other salon here, use this stuff and put these two things together and put it together and you get all this things going. And, and uh, sometimes I'm starting to get hang of it, but I found out about this process when it was called keratin or something. And uh, they can suddenly, supposedly help it not be the afro that it tends to do if I in default setting. So I'm going to try that out. You, know, you get that done in San Diego, but it's like three, four hundred bucks. But up here, it's, you know, about half the price. I'm going to try it up here. And supposedly it lasts for, you know, four or five months and, you know, kind of get it uh, a little more manageable and less, you know, 1972 looking. Yeah, yeah, what the heck? You know, the whole goal was the long, blonde, flowing Thor locks. <laughs> or something but anyway uh so i'm gonna try that out and see how that goes so lots of cool stuff going on uh let's see so yeah uh, but that's only partially the reason why you're tuning in of course you're tuning in because you love me and you like my books and you want to hear about me but also you want to hear more of the story and the story of the pericles conspiracy which we have been reading and the last time we met up Joe had hooked up with the underground and found that they were kind of, well, they kind of suck. Their planning process sucks. They're like, oh man, I can't talk to anybody. I don't know what to do. And oh, geez, we have to give up. And she's like, screw you guys. We're going to get this stuff settled. You can't figure it out without Becky. We're going to go get Becky. And well, let's see what happens after that. Right. Um, hope you guys enjoy this. Um, well, we're just going to do one chapter here because of, uh, well, we'll see how the time of the week goes. It's Tuesday evening now. I want to get this out by Wednesday, uh, depending on <laughs> the amount of time that I spend reading and hanging out with friends. I may or may not get this out in time. So it's either going to be one or two chapters. Can't promise anything right now as I'm recording this. Uh, let's say one, and if you get two, it's a bonus. How's that sound? All right, cool. I'll talk to you on the flip side. The Pericles Conspiracy. Written by me, read by me, you know you like listening to it. Chapter 28. Jailbreak. The van was old. Old enough they could not support a database implant uplink, and they had been developed before Joe departed Gliza on the run back to Earth that had changed everything. Joe supposed it would not have been difficult to upgrade the van's electronics, but for whatever reason its owners never bothered to. Now that Citizens for Liberty, and she had finally found out what they called themselves, though she still called it the Underground, at least in her own head, CFL seemed a bit trite. Well, now that Citizens for Liberty used it, Joe had no doubt its electronics would never be upgraded. The lack of connectivity suited their need for stealth and security well. Joe rolled her shoulders. She and her companions had been sitting in the van in their predetermined location for two hours, awaiting the signal and the passenger seat, however well padded, was beginning to wear on her. She was developing a kink in her upper back. Should be any time now. Joe glanced aside at her companion in the van's cockpit, a chubby guy dressed as she was in a loose black jumpsuit and matching gloves. He had graying black hair, a thick beard, and small beady eyes. His name was Henry. Over the last week, she had gotten to know him fairly well. Well enough to know that he was cool under pressure, at least theoretical pressure, and that he had little love for the ideals that the others in the CFL shared. He was driven by anger. Somehow, some way, he never explained how, the government screwed him, and he was out to screw the government right back. He never explained exactly what he meant by that, either. 
You've been saying that for the last hour, Henry, said Raoul, from the passenger seat area behind them. Joe was surprised that Raoul was with them. After the doctor fixed his arm, Pedro gave him the money to cover his expenses from the evening, plus extra for his trouble, and lined him up with people who would furnish a new fake identity for him. But for whatever reason, he opted to continue providing his services to the CFL. Maybe he wanted to screw the government too, or maybe they just paid more than he was used to. No sense griping, Joe said. They had known it could be a long wait. Their information was imprecise at best. Raoul sniffed and went back to monitoring his instruments. When the call came in, he would be the first to see it. It had taken a while to get Malcolm to agree with her idea, let alone Pedro. The NSA had Becky in their field office. The CFL had been able to learn that much from the few contacts they still had that talked with them. But the field office was hardly set up for long-term prisoner detention. At some point, they would have to move her to a proper prison. When that happened, the CFL would have an opportunity to bust her out. It was risky. Odds were it would just result in a lot of them getting arrested as well. But if it worked and they got Becky out, they could get to the backed up data drives and proceed with a plan. The only other alternative was to admit defeat, and Joe was not about to do that. She was surprised that Malcolm was not on board immediately, but he eventually agreed, and from there it was a fairly short work for the two of them to browbeat Pedro into it. Not that he came along for the operation himself. He had other things to do. Joe smirked and shook her head. It was just as well. He was a little bit too green for this sort of thing anyway. Not that Joe was much more experienced in this area either. She was honest enough with herself to admit that much. Leadership, command, organization, those things she could do in her sleep. Blatantly flaunting the law, though, that was still new and took a little bit of getting used to. A burst of static followed by a series of electronic beeps issued momentarily from the speakers mounted in the van's rear. The noise shut off abruptly, and Joe looked over her shoulder to see Raoul hunched over the workstation there, headphones pressed to his ears while he quickly jotted down notes on the workstation's interface pad. He must have unplugged the headphones for a short while, and who could blame him? Even the most ergonomically designed unit could become uncomfortable over time. Raoul finished transcribing and looked up. His expression was tight, nervous, and he appeared a bit pale. Meeting Joe's gaze, he nodded quickly. Three minutes. Jacqueline Moore peered at the transport van through her windshield and scowled. It was bad enough she had to take part in this bit of busy work. But did it really have to be scheduled on a Sunday? Not that she cared for Sundays more than any other day, really. Her parents attended Mass regularly, but she had long ago left that superstition aside. But this Sunday was supposed to be a day off, and she got few enough of them that she did not relish the thought of losing even one to work. Especially not the mindless work. But that's how it went sometimes. Two weeks ago, she'd been riding high. She had silenced a potentially huge security leak, was responsible for taking down one of the largest CFL cells ever discovered, and she had secured the cooperation of a well-placed informant who could no doubt lead her to even more arrests in a short order. As a result, she had received commendations from the entire chain of command, up to and including Deputy Director Chandini. There was talk of early promotion for herself and Jesus, and maybe a transfer away from this godforsaken pit of a city to someplace more livable. And then it all went to hell. Fucking De Stefano, she muttered under her breath. The driver, a rookie in a nondescript navy blue suit and a weak tie, whose name she forgot, looked at her curiously. Ma'am? Nothing, just keep driving. The rookie blanched and looked back to the street ahead, his lips compressing into a tight scowl. Jackie almost felt ashamed. She probably did not need to have used such a cutting tone. But she was not in the mood to talk, at least not to the likes of him. The fact that she was stuck with him until Jesus recovered, if he ever did, and Gubay's plasma bolt had taken off most of his kneecap, just made the situation more annoying. But she did have to work with the guy. Jackie sighed and looked back at the rookie again. Sorry, it's been a tough week. He flashed an understanding smile her way. I can only imagine. They rode in silence for almost a full minute. Then he piped up again. Is it true Chandini threatened to send you to Titan for life? Jackie blinked. Where have you heard that one? Ah, the water cooler rumor mill. She had always hated that. No, not even close. Chandini had, in fact, threatened her if she failed to correct the situation quickly, but not with anything as pleasant as being stuck on Titan for the rest of her life. 
She almost shuddered as she recalled the conversation, but forced herself to stillness quickly. It would not do to show weakness in front of the rookie. Well, that's good. I'd hate to see that happen to you. The rookie smiled at her again. He was actually not bad looking. She had not noticed that before. You know I- Oh, fuck! He slammed on the brakes and the vehicles fishtailed, almost losing control completely as the wheels struck a leftover puddle from yesterday's rainfall. But Jackie hardly noticed. Her whole concentration was riveted ahead as she watched her life end. The truck slammed into the side of the prison transport van, sending the van careening sideways for several meters before it slammed into the metal and concrete guardrail separating the edge of the street from the pedestrian walkway beyond. An assortment of people, from businessmen in expensive suits to vacationers in shorts and t-shirts, leapt away from the impact zone lest they be crushed. Joe was relieved to see that the guardrail held. They were not there to hurt anybody, after all. Not if they could help it. She glanced aside at Henry, who nodded curtly. Then they both pulled dark ski masks down over their faces, and he put the van into gear. In the intersection ahead, traffic had come to a standstill. The truck effectively blocked most of the oncoming lanes, and those that were not quickly blocked themselves as cars screeched to a stop. Some of them contained the other teams in their little raid, Joe knew, but she still felt exposed as they sped towards the scene. Henry slammed on the brakes as they came even with the truck, and then put the van into park and hopped out. Joe followed, drawing her plasma pistol as she did. The prison van driver and the man riding shotgun were visible through the cracked plastic glass of the windshield and side windows. They looked too stunned to do anything right at the moment, but that could change quickly. To her right, two men in black ski masks like hers hopped out of a stopped car. One trained a rifle on the cab of the prison van. It was his job to make sure the two men in the van did not do anything rash, and the other covered the street to the right. Joe followed Henry as he hurried toward the back of the prison van but she noticed the truck driver descending from his driver's seat and also shouldering a rifle. Malcolm's eyes glinted with excitement and... glee? And he shot a wink at her as she passed him before turning his attention to the street to the left. Was he any good at shooting a rifle? Joe could not recall. She hoped he had been practicing. Henry reached the back door and pulled a small roll of what looked like paper out of the pouch on his belt. Unrolling it quickly, he pressed it to the seam where the van's two rear doors met and tapped it in two places, then stepped back. The strip quickly turned red, then a scalding white as light and heat, intense enough that Joe had to step back and look away to avoid being dazzled by the glare and the temperature, flowed out of it and into the metal of the doors. Whatever locking mechanism the van had could not stand up to that. Within seconds, the strip had burned out, leaving only black and ash marking its place. Henry glanced at Joe. She could see the question in his eyes. All set? She nodded and raised her pistol, sliding in on the door and whatever might be inside. Henry grasped the door's handle and pulled it open. Jackie threw the passenger's side door open and leapt from the car almost before it came to a halt, drawing her sidearm with practice speed as she went. Though there had been speculation about possible trouble with this, or another prisoner transfer, she never really expected the CFL to be so bold. It was before they had kept to the shadows, working their little schemes and playing their cloak and dagger games. They would occasionally contribute to something big enough to draw attention to themselves, but they never came out directly, which is why it had been so difficult to locate them. If not for the chink in the armor they had revealed during their interaction with Ishikawa, Jackie scowled. She was involved in this. Jackie knew it instinctively. This sort of direct, aggressive action was clearly the sort of thing Ishikawa would go for. Her bio and psych profile made that very clear. She was a woman of action. It would not readily sit in the shadows. Jackie had to admit a grudging respect for the erstwhile captain. A pity she had gone so far off the rails. But that was neither here nor there. They were not going to get this prisoner, not on her watch, with that sentence hanging over her head. All that passed through Jackie's mind in a split second long enough to hunker down in a crouch behind the car's hood and survey the scene. Two perpetrators were at the rear of the transport van. They had applied a cutting strip to the doors and would have them open in short order if their placement was even halfway competent, which Jackie did not doubt for a second. A third peered over the sights of a plasma rifle down the street toward her, but he was mostly focused on the area to her left. It did not appear he had noticed her or the rookie. Jackie smiled thinly and flexed her fingers around the grip of her weapon. The sentry's oversight was going to doom their whole gambit. 
She glanced to her left, where the rookie was just emerging from the vehicle, from the passenger side, the side away from the action, just as the book said. At least the academy still taught the basics correctly. He was flushed, his eyes narrowed, he was certainly nervous, frightened even, but he did not show it, at least not overtly. Jackie found her initial opinion of him improving. There might be some substance there after all. A quick series of hand gestures later, the rookie nodded and slid back toward the rear of the vehicle, crouching to maintain cover. Jackie moved to the front bumper and peeked over again. The transport van's rear doors were open. The guards inside were cowed, hands raised under the aim of one of the libertarians, a female. The prisoner, bleary-eyed from her sedatives, was slowly exiting with assistance from the other bandit. Jackie looked back toward the sentry. He was looking backward toward the prisoner. It was now or never, and the fool had just given her all the opening she needed. Jackie made a chopping gesture with her left hand, signaling the rookie to move out. Then she rose and moved around the bumper, bringing her weapon up to a firing position. In her peripheral vision, she saw the rookie did the same. And then he went down, flung from his feet by a ball of plasma that streaked in front of Jackie from out of nowhere. Dropping to the ground, she rolled to her right and brought her weapon to bear, and found herself looking down the barrels of a pair of plasma rifles, the leftmost one still releasing a small wisp of post-discharged gases from inside its muzzle. The two men watched her coolly, eyes flat behind their black ski masks. They stood behind the hood of a car ten meters to her right. How had she not noticed them before? They had the drop on her. She knew it. They knew it. It only took a second to decide. Chandini's punishment would be bad, yes, but it would not be death. Live to fight another day and all that. Jackie, lying there on her belly, raised her hands and tossed her weapon aside. The men relaxed visibly. The one on the left glanced to the side. Jackie followed his glance and saw the prisoner getting inside a van, the one that had followed the truck to the scene. The woman who had covered her exit from the transport and the unattentive sentry were close behind. A moment later, the van doors closed, its motor started, and it sped away. The sound of a motor off to her right drew Jackie's gaze back in that direction. The two riflemen were also gone, their car speeding away after the van. Jackie got to her feet and retrieved her weapon and was relieved, and surprised at that, to hear the rookie groan behind her. Son of a bitch, he muttered as he struggled to his feet. Glad you remembered your vest. Damn right. He stumbled forward to her side and looked around. He whistled softly, then shook his head. Son of a bitch. We are fucked. He had no idea how right he was. Alright, so as advertised, uh, here it is Wednesday. I got a lot... <laughs> going on yesterday i'm finishing up this here wednesday afternoon and i was only had time to get the one chapter done and read but on the bright side i'm figuring out more every day about how to make sound sound good and uh the awesomeness of how to use this mic i normally keep it off camera but um thinking having it closer to do like this actually gets better sound than it does so eh, slowly but surely i'm figuring this stuff out um saves me from doing some post-editing and amplification shifts and things like that, I think. Anyway, so yeah, so, so just the one chapter, but as a consolation prize, you do get to go read Doppelganger for free as part of the Infinite Bard promotion on my website. So go to the website. I'll put the link to where the story is um, in the show notes, and you can go check that out. Go read the story. It's a uh, you know, short mystery. It's like 9,500 words, so it'll take you a you know, little while to read it. Not a huge long time, but I think it's fun. You can tell me what you think. And then you can spread the word, tell all your buddies to go read it, and tell them to come read the uh, Pericles Conspiracy, too. And buy the book. Buy all the books. That's what it's here for. Um, as you know, you can go to my website, michaelkingswood.com, where the Infinite Bard story is posted now. But you can sign up for newsletter, so you can find out when I have new releases going on. Um, and they're not always put out for free at the same time. Um, you can also become a, a subscription member of the site and a few bucks a month helps support my writing endeavors and also get uh, exclusive freebies. Well, not freebies because you're paying some money, but exclusive things that other people won't get and, you know, easy access to all the books without having to go to all the pain of going to Amazon or my site or buying them because depending on what tier you pick, you get them all or not. And things like that. So you can go check that out. Um, or just, hey, drop me a line. 
You can send me an email at the website, or you can go to Facebook, though I'm almost never there. You can go to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash michael.kingswood. Um, I still retain the page, even though I don't use it much. I'm not even sure why I still do, but I do. So that's there. Um, the blog gets posted to a bunch of different places, Facebook, Steam it, a few things. These videos go to YouTube and to BitChute, uh, so you can find me in all those places, and as I find other places that are not a pain in the neck to get to, I'll do that. I have, tr- you know, I know there's minds.com and a few other places, but the problem is, the good thing about BitChute, right, is I upload my video to YouTube and BitChute sort of um, it uses the API to take the video and put it on their site, so I only have to upload it once. Same thing with uh, Steam it and Facebook for my blog. I do a blog post and there's all these uh, API engines and stuff where the blog automatically shoots to these other places. And there's a way to get the video direct from from YouTube to Steam it uh, with just putting a little hashtag and a tag on the video. So the Steam place gets the videos easy. But like Mines and some of these other places, you have to upload it again. And, um, I know, poor woe is me. Oh, you have to upload it another time. How hard is that? Well, it's not hard. It's just annoying. So if these other places would develop API tools to make it easier to do things, I'd be more. I would use them more consistently. Because as it is, I I have accounts in a bunch of other places, but I don't use them so much. Um, but that's just me being lazy. Anyway, that's where you can find me. Uh, come say, say hi and tell me what you think of the stuff. Best way to tell me what you think of the stuff is if you buy it or not, of course. But best of all, but the most important thing to do, of course, is tell all your friends. Like, subscribe, share this. Tell everybody, hey, that Kingsman guy's cool. Go check out his stories. Appreciate that a lot. Um, that's really all I got for you. Hopefully you're continuing to like the Pericles Conspiracy novel, and hopefully you go read Doppelganger and you like it. If you do like it, let me know. Leave a review someplace. Let everybody else know. All right, that's all I really got. Hopefully you guys have a good rest of the week. I'll talk to you in a few days. Until then, don't do anything I wouldn't do.